Welcome to the third day of this excellent uh, conference about the South Korean film industry. My name is Dan Herbert and I teach film and media here at the University of Michigan. Um, you, this is the third panel um, on the topic of transformations in the South Korean film industry. And we have two fantastic speakers. I'd say that um, as an attendee so far, this conference has been really excellent with wonderful talks by great scholars, as well as creative professionals in the movie business. And so I'm sure that this panel will be similarly interesting and exciting. So I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then they will give their presentations and then there will be an opportunity for Q and A at the end. Um, and if you do have questions that you'd like the speakers to address, then put, please put them in the Q and A um, function on, on your Zoom. So our first speaker today will be Daniel Martin, who's Associate Professor in Film Studies in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at CAIST and has previously held position posts as lecturer at Queens University, Belfast, and as honorary researcher at Lancaster University. His recent research concerns animation, genre cinema, and the international circulation of films from East Asia. He's the author of Extreme Asia, The Rise of Cult Cinema from the Far East, co-editor of Korean Horror Cinema, and Hong Kong Horror Cinema, all books that I really enjoy. He has published articles in many places, Cinema Journal, the Journal of Film and Video, the Journal of Popular Culture, Continuum, Animation, Film International, Acta Koreana, Asian Cinema, the Journal of Japanese and Korean Cinema, and the Journal of Korean Studies. He's currently working on an exciting project, uh, a monograph for the BFI's film classic series on Hayao Miyazaki's Kiki's Delivery Service. service excuse me. <clears throat> and today he will be talking about the Korean, South Korean animation industry. Our second speaker will be uh, Sung A. Lee, and she's a lecturer in Asian studies in the Department of International Studies at Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia. Her major research focus is on fiction, film, and television drama of East Asia with particular attention to Korea. Her research centers on relationships between cultural ideologies in Asian societies and representational strategies. She's interested in cognitive approaches to adaptation studies, Asian popular culture, Asian cinema, and the impact of colonization in Asia trauma studies, fiction, and film produced in the aftermath of the Korean War, as well as the literature and popular media of the Korean diaspora. Her work, her work has also appeared in many places, in, including such journals as Adaptation, Asian Cinema, International Research in Children's Literature, Journal of Asian American Studies, and Mosaic, and in many edited collections as well, including Subjectivity in Asian Children's Literature and Film, Fairy Tale Films Beyond Disney, the fairy tale world and Asian children's literature and film in a global age. So, um, our like I said, our first speaker is Daniel Martin, and I'll just uh, send it right over to him, and we can get things going. Uh, okay, uh, am I still muted? Can everyone hear me? Okay, uh, I think you can. Hopefully, um, thank you, Daniel, very much for that um, very kind introduction. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, thank you to all of you um, for joining us um, from wherever in the world you are, whatever time it is um, for this uh, conference. Um, I'm going to talk about um, something I'm very passionate about, which is South Korean um, animation. Um, and it's uh, this presentation is based on research that has been long gestating uh, for me uh, that's uh, been published here and there. Uh, but essentially, I've been building up um, several observations about um, the successes and failures of Korean animation as an industry, because it's always struck me as an industry that is so full of potential. And it's a potential that has never quite been realized. So um, uh, this presentation is going to talk through some of the um, aspects of the animation industry in South Korea that I find quite interesting. Uh, things like invisible labor, consumer nationalism, and the global ambitions of uh, the Korean animation uh, industry. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about both uh, the domestic and the international profile of South Korean animation, considering um, popularity, you know, is obviously something that can be measured in various ways. Uh, but I think visibility is also um, quite a, a, a crucial way to understand um, uh, the prominence of uh, uh, animated films from South Korea. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how um, successes and failures uh, in the South Korean animation industry are often tied 
to quite complex uh, expressions of national identity. And um, if we apply ideas like uh, cultural odor uh, to these films, I think it's quite revealing. I'll talk a bit about some older films. I'll talk about some more recent films, uh, as well as some international co-productions. So uh, this is an ongoing work in progress. And um, I presented various iterations of this research several times now. I think uh, Sangjun has been there for all of them. So he probably uh, has asked me to publish this research. So I'll just stop talking about it and move on to something else. So I, I deeply appreciate that I'll be part of this forthcoming book, The South Korean Film Industry. Uh, and I, I also look forward to uh, finally um, uh, actually, you know, publishing this research and uh, uh, kind of putting a line under it. So, um, uh, I'd like to talk um, first about a moment of uh, profound excitement in the South Korean animation industry. Uh, two years ago, I saw the release of a film called Underdog. It was co-directed by uh, Oh Sung Yoon, who's uh, best known as the director of um, a film that was the most successful animation, um, at least domestically, in South Korean history. And uh, Underdog had its world premiere at the Buchan International Film Festival. A fantastic film festival and uh, it was noteworthy because um, all the um, uh, tickets sold out in just nine seconds it's the fastest the film has ever sold out at Bifan and um, a lot of that excitement and interest in the film seemed to be driven by uh, the voice cast the lead voice actor uh, who plays this uh, blue and white dog uh, is a k-pop idol D.O. Uh, from the uh, Chinese Korean boy band uh, EXO. So um, this was a film that seemed like it could perhaps do very remarkable things in the animation industry, that it perhaps could um, you know, set new records and um, demonstrate greater success than had been seen for a very, very long time indeed. However, when the film uh, was actually released um, uh, nationwide for its uh, domestic commercial release, um, it achieved a respectable but pretty disappointing 194,000 admissions. And um, I say disappointing because obviously if you know the Korean film industry, you know that millions, if not tens of millions of admissions uh, would mark a very successful film. Animation has always struggled to achieve numbers, anything like live action cinema. So that number of 194,000 is actually pretty good for an animated film in South Korea. It could have done more, but um, I would say that's not a complete failure if we judge it compared to other uh, South Korean films. So this is just one example, I think, of uh, an animated film which seemed like it might uh, achieve a greater success than it actually did. And um, if we look back through the history of uh, the Korean animation industry. There have been moments of very significant success uh, when films did seem to capture the national imagination and um, really uh, stimulate a great deal of uh, interest uh, from audiences. Uh, the first ever animated film, uh, feature film produced in South Korea was Hong Gil Dong in 1967. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that we see the Korean animation industry really starting to um, to uh, uh, become um, an industry which could um, reliably and consistently uh, produce films at a speed that would put them in line with an animation industry like say America or Japan. Um, the biggest success of the 1970s was Robotech 1V, uh, which was essentially um, a plagiarism of a Japanese animation, but um, layered with a very, very strong sense of nationalism. And um, it's, I mean, the film is all about that uh, Taekwondo is the greatest martial art in the world and that uh, Korean science is the most advanced science in the world. So what these films both share in common, I think, is their appeal to consumer nationalism. Hong Gil Dong, of course, draws on one of the best known uh, Korean folk tales, focusing on a hero who is in many ways emblematic of a kind of a Korean national identity. Robotech on V, likewise, is a hyper patriotic, um, you know, futurist science fiction fantasy uh, about um, the great achievements of uh, Korea and Koreans around the world. So both of these films directly appeal 
uh, to that sense of uh, Korean identity in a way that undoubtedly resonated with Korean audiences. And I think the question of national identity, the question of uh, the degree to which animation um, visibly displays its national origin or directly appeals to its immediate domestic audience is actually a really critical question in animation studies. Um, Japanese animation is obviously a much more um, uh, successful animation industry. It's much better known internationally and has been studied much more uh, academically. And one of the key debates in studies of Japanese animation circulate around the idea uh, of what uh, Koichi Iwabuchi calls cultural odor, um, which is the way that particular consumer goods can be positively identified with particular national cultures and national identities. And uh, Iwabuchi has argued that Japanese animation is effectively odorless. It's effectively stateless uh, in that its worldwide popularity uh, is really the result of its appeal to very universal values, that these are not simply stories about Japanese identity for Japanese people, that they are specifically designed to transcend those kinds of national uh, boundaries and, um, and resonate with a global audience. Uh, Susan Napier, uh, who's also a leading scholar of Japanese animation, uh, uses the Japanese word mukokuseki uh, to talk about this phenomenon. Uh, when she notes that um, one of animation's most popular genres, science fiction, is the one that's far less likely to be culturally specific. Um, that sometimes these uh, animations do contain um, cultural elements related to Japanese issues. They're usually uh, played out across stateless fantasy scapes or future cities, faraway galaxies. Uh, the characters in anime often do not look particularly Japanese. Instead, they participate in what might be called a non-culturally specific anime style. So this is a really important um, uh, question, I think, the question of um, cultural odor in animation and trying to understand the connections between the extent to which that cultural odor is detectable and the success of animation on the world stage. There are certainly uh, you know, complications and counterpoints uh, to some of these views. And I think it's undeniable that for a certain segment of uh, the audience of Japanese animation, it's the Japaneseness that is actually central to the appeal. Um, there's a kind of an Orientalism or a fetishization of the foreignness of the media uh, by some audiences who like it particularly because it is Japanese. So uh, there's lots of nuance to this debate, but the point I want to really reinforce is that national identity is of central importance to understanding uh, the global flow of animation from East Asia. Now, if you look at uh, precisely that, the global flow of animation from South Korea, uh, you see several interesting things. Um, South Korean animation has been exported. It has been sent around the world. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, going all the way back to the 1970s, Korean animation has been released on videotape, on home media, uh, in many English language markets. But what usually happens is that it's dubbed into English. And um, by removing the Korean language, if we are dealing with examples of stateless animation that lacks a Korean cultural odor, there's essentially nothing recognizably Korean about it. So Goldwing 123, uh, which is another kind of heroic giant robot film, but one which has much less nationalism than Robot Tech 1V, was exported um, to uh, America in the early 1980s. Red Hawk, uh, likewise, was dubbed into English and uh, distributed in America in the 1990s by a company that primarily released Japanese animation. And there's virtually nothing in this film that would let an audience know that it's from Korea. And so it could very easily be mistaken simply as another Japanese production dubbed into English for a Western market. So um, there's a a kind of an invisibility to this visibility of Korean animation. It's a contradiction, but I think that while Korean animation has found a global audience, it's often found that audience in ways that effectively um, um, ignore or delete its national origin. That's certainly been the case as well with Korea's um, biggest successes in terms of its animation industry. The Korean animation industry is 
one of the most successful in the world. That is without question. What complicates this is the fact that most of the animation being produced by South Korean studios is uh, outsourced. It's animation being produced for American television, for uh, Japanese television and theatrical animation productions. The Simpsons, Family Guy are animated in uh, South Korea. Parts of even Miyazaki's Spirited Away were animated in South Korea. Nobody would describe these properties as Korean in any meaningful way. Creatively, the stories, the characters, everything is controlled um, by non-Korean uh, directors, non-Korean storytellers, non-Korean investors. And so it's simply labor and it's largely invisible labor that's going into these productions. So what we've seen um, over the last um, 10, 15, maybe 20 years uh, in South Korea is um, a kind of a creative push, a very self-conscious, self-aware desire um, exhibited by the Korean animation industry to be um, more successful, to produce creatively distinct works, to effectively change this narrative, to escape these perceptions of, um, of um, being less successful than other animation industries. Um, and it's driven by several factors. The first of these is recognition, the desire to be known as more than simply a hub of outsourced animation. It's also driven by competition. Other animation industries have started to also uh, become very, very um, uh, competitive uh, in terms of producing outsourced animation. For example, the last 20 years have seen many studios um, coming up in places like Singapore, uh, which are, you know, are basically undercutting Korean companies and producing animation for American studios more cheaply, uh, which means that um, there is a danger. The outsourcing work will dry up, the outsourcing um, income will diminish, and the industry will need to find other ways uh, to, um, to make profit and uh, to produce new work. There's a sense of missed opportunity here as well. Uh, as we all know, the last um, 20 years have seen an incredible explosion of Korean um, popular culture around the world, K-pop, Hallyu, Korean cinema and TV drama. Animation is um, very conspicuous in its absence from these waves of global success. And there's a sense that if all of these other uh, forms of popular entertainment from Korea can achieve success, then animation should try to grab this moment as well. Finally, um, is the frustrating sense that children's animation in this country, in fact, has been very successful. Uh, the character of Pororo, who is ubiquitous among Korean children, demonstrate that the industry can achieve really remarkable success uh, in many, many senses. Uh, and yet this hasn't really been achieved um, in terms of adult skewing entertainment or family skewing entertainment the way it has in Japan or America. So the first uh, film to really um, come out of this uh, new era of creative ambition was a film called Wonderful Days. It was intended to be um, the country's first animated blockbuster, very much made in that kind of post shitty uh, mode of big investment and an attempt to uh, simultaneously uh, copy and improve upon Hollywood action film formulas. It had a huge marketing budget, lots of merchandising. Uh, it had a worldwide release. Uh, and interestingly, it was designed by its director to be deliberately and emphatically stateless. It's a film which is pretty much bereft of any signifiers of Korean culture or Korean history. And the film was subsequently an absolute disaster in Korea. It spent only two weeks in cinemas it earned back a fraction of its production budget. And um, it was seen to be completely out of touch at a time when Korean blockbusters were very emphatically appealing to um, you know, Korean nationalism and um, uh, preoccupations that were particularly resonant with Korean audiences. Wonderful Days ignored all of those uh, ways to engage with local audiences and um, they were totally apathetic to it. On its international release, uh, the film also fared very poorly. Critics simply felt that there was nothing special about it. Uh, it came at a time when Japanese animation, again, Miyazaki's works, 
very prominent in the West. And um, this compared very poorly to those kinds of films. So um, it was a failure on several levels, I think. And it's notable that it failed possibly because of this lack of cultural identity, this lack of cultural odor. I'm gonna talk very quickly now about some animated co-productions between South Korea and Japan, because in the wake of Wonderful Days, co-productions with Japan were seen as a way to possibly minimize risk and possibly guarantee uh, a slightly larger global audience because uh, Japanese animation has those pre-established um, flows um, to audiences all over the world. Ragnarok um, is a TV animation. Uh, it's primarily produced in Japan, but uh, there were some key uh, Korean creatives in, involved in the production. Uh, it's based on Korean source material. And so looking at something like Ragnarok, we might wonder the extent to which it displays any kind of cultural odor, any kind of um, uh, origin of um, uh, Korean identity. Uh, so if we look at this, it's, a, it's an animation made primarily in Japan, uh, Ragnarok the Animation, which is an adaptation of uh, a video game, an MMORPG, uh, which was produced uh, in Korea. So it's a Korean video game here being turned into a Korean slash Japanese animation. Ragnarok Online itself though is also an adaptation. It's based on a Korean manhwa comic book series uh, called Ragnarok that was very, very popular uh, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. But if we go back even further, Ragnarok itself is also a kind of uh, an adaptation or a reimagining of prior source material in this case, it's based on Norse mythology. So if you trace this all the way back to um, its inception, you see that the source that's guiding all of this um, you know, multimedia production is in fact completely un-Korean. And therefore, when you look at something like Ragnarok, it has this you know, fantastic, you know, historical, stateless, ethnically indistinct setting and so there's, again, nothing here that would make you realize that this was made based on a Korean property. And therefore, any success it achieved would have to be judged to be economic rather than cultural, I think. A more interesting case, and this is a film that endlessly fascinates me, is a film called Blade of the Phantom Master uh, from 2004. Now, this is famous for being the first uh, feature-length Japanese-South Korean co-production. And um, it was heralded as like this, you know, this, this big new um, paradigm in co-production where creativity would be absolutely equally shared between both uh, Japan and Korea. It's again based on prior source material, um, a manga manhwa series that was simultaneously co-published in Japan and Korea, but which draws um, very heavily on Korean folklore, uh, specifically um, Chunhyang. Um, this sexy ninja woman you can see on the poster, that is this version of Chunhyang in this film. It's set in this kind of semi-stateless fantasy world um, where you have heroic warriors, but also demons and magic and wizards and you know, all kinds of um, um, impossible trappings. Now, when the film was released in Japan, its Koreanness was absolutely emphasized. And uh, there was an attempt here to persuade the Japanese audience that um, because it was a Korean co-production, that that would make them see Korean culture and Korean animation in a new way, and that it would uh, herald a new era in full-scale animation collaboration between Korea and Japan. That did not happen, unfortunately. Um, but when the film went to the West, when it was released in English-speaking territories like um, America, Australia, uh, the DVD, um, really quite oddly, essentially, again, deleted the Koreanness of this film. When it was released in global markets, for example, you would have the option to watch it in English or in Japanese as the only two audio options. And um, the Korean director, Ante Gun, is not credited in the English language version. It's simply credited as a film by Joji Shimura. So there is an erasure of the Korean aspect of this production that's quite troubling. And that again, I mean, if you know the story of Chunhyang, you will recognize this as a Korean story. Uh, but for the millions of potential audiences who don't know the story of Chunhyang, 
There's simply nothing there for them to latch onto as Korean. Okay, a couple more examples, and I'm just going to wrap up and finish for this morning. Uh, the most successful animation ever made in Korea is uh, Leafy, A Hen Into the Wild. It achieved over 2.2 million admissions, which for an animated film is a very high number, uh, 10 years ago in 2011. And it's the kind of film that we would look at and assume is absolutely stateless. You know, it's got anthropomorphized animals, no human characters at all living in this kind of geographically nondescript farm. But I think what's more striking about the film is um, its narrative structure. This is effectively a Shinpa film. And I think this is where the film really displays um, quite powerfully its connection to Korean cinematic history and its acknowledgement of Korean values. And that's, I think, why this film resonated so strongly with local audiences. My last example is to talk about um, the most promising auteur of new Korean animation, Yon Sang-ho, who um, has made some absolutely superb animated films over the last decade. The King of Pigs, The Fake, uh, these are both widely acclaimed films. Uh, they've been shown at film festivals. Generally speaking, when people watch these films, they like them. They're critically very well regarded. But uh, Yon Sang-ho is much better known uh, for his live action cinema. Uh, he's the director of Train to Busan, which was a smash hit both in Korea and around the world. Um, but what many people don't realize is that Train to Busan was accompanied by um, an animated companion piece called Soul Station. Now, Soul Station was um, designed as a prequel to Train to Busan. It's this great kind of intertextual um, linked storytelling. It was released just one month later in Korean cinemas. Yet while Train to Busan achieved 11.5 million admissions, Soul Station ended its brief cinema run with like 1% of that. So it's a tiny, tiny fraction. And we have to ask, is this a missed opportunity or is this a demonstration that there are certain limitations to Korean animation? Because we would have thought that if ever a Korean animated film would achieve success, it would be something like this, which is intimately connected to an absolutely massive smash hit blockbuster. To wrap up, I'm gonna come back to the case of Underdog and the K-pop idol that couldn't quite save this film by talking about a forthcoming film. This hasn't been released yet, Princess Aya. I saw this film at the Busan Film Festival uh, in 2019. Uh, it uses CGV's Screen X format. Uh, again, it casts K-pop idols Baek Ah Young and uh, Pak Jin Young as the lead voice actors. Their fandoms are propelling a great deal of pre-release hype and interest. And yet the film is effectively stateless. It's a fantasy with no signs of Korean architecture, Korean fashion, Korean identity. And uh, I have to suspect that that will be um, a critical factor in its um, almost inevitable lack of success when it's released commercially. Uh, it was supposed to happen this year, uh, that's, or last year rather, that didn't happen because of the coronavirus. I'm not sure when it will be released, but um, I'm pretty cynical at this point about its chances for success. Uh, so when looking at Korean cinema um, as a whole, it's absolutely a story of success. When looking at Korean animation in particular, it's a story of you know, frustratingly um, uh, unrealized potential, I think. So this is a snippet of my work and I'll be able to explore these issues in much more detail in the chapter I'm writing for Sang Jun's book. So stay tuned for more. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for that, Daniel. That was excellent. Uh, really looking forward to the Q&A. And uh, now we'll um, pass it on to Sung A. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Daniel. And especially thank you for the technical support from Todd. Thank you. And I'm really delighted to be here. So South Korean remakes of older Korean films have not been abandoned in the 21st century. So I'll start my video, maybe not the video, but share screen. Okay. So, uh,
Okay. There have been more remakes of foreign films that have done well in the country of origin, especially from Hong Kong, Japan, and the USA, with a sprinkling from Europe and South America. Conversely, numerous Korean films have been remade transnationally. It may be that when the local industry was reinvigorated in the 1990s, producers and directors were primarily focused on the global context of cinema, the domains of exports and transnational remakes. However, there has also been a push to recognize the great achievement of filmmakers and films during the two decades preceding the coup of 1979 and the subsequent malaise of the cinema industry. It is important to acknowledge the past accomplishments which underpin the present industry. Recognition has meant that most remakes in South Korea in the 21st century have been of films that come from the older era, this older, older era. Um, films based on traditional or folk story belong to a different category and uh, F2 have been remade several times. The story of Chunyang is the most frequently remade film in Korea. While the longer version of my project includes Chunyang, I will limit my paper today to remakes of two well-known films to examine the contrast between an older and a 21st century film and the different processes of remaking that have been at work. When remade films retain the title of the original, as in the two pairs I'm concerned with, The Housemaid and Late Atom, they invite the common assumption that a remake can only be unoriginal and inevitably inferior to its pretext. And therefore, the new version must be in some way assert that it is a better film. Such assumptions seemed unavoidable in the case of The Housemaid, since Kim Ki-young's 1960 film is widely re regarded as one of the greatest of all Korean films. And so an attempt to remake it must seem presumptuous. At the core of the, the argument, however, is the distinction between story the kernel script, which embodies the existence of action characters and to some extent setting, and discourse, the manner in which a story is present, rep represented through cinematography, structure, order, montage, mission scene, sound design, and so on. Discourse is also the, the element which viewers participate in to interpret the thematic significance of the narrative. In other words, a recognizable kernel script may yield diverse meanings. Uh, such diversity is not surprising because uh, a kernel script is a bundle of under unelaborated components such uh, and as in um, as seen in this slide. Uh, scripts can also be blended. For example, the scheming and sexually aggressive housemaid in Kim Gi Young's film initially marks a blending of a home invasion script. In his 2010 remake, Im sang Su does not introduce that motif until near the ending of the film. Kim gi famously plays with the malleability of kernel scripts in the story within a story frame of the housemaid. The story begins with a male protagonist, Kim dong sik showing his wife a newspaper report about a man who committed adultery with his maid, which was a criminal offense at the time. The wife expresses horror, but the husband defends it by pointing out that a maid is deeply embedded in a household, which depends upon her physically and emotionally, and she might be also be considered as sexually available. That script then becomes a basis of the narrative that follows. Viewers accept it as an everyday melodrama until the epilogue returns to the opening frame, now modified by the presence of the maid. The surprise return uh, overthrows the narrative and suggests it has merely been a moral fable based on the newspaper article. However, when Myung Suk greedily sniffs Dong Sik's cigarette smoke, the film repeats its recurrent motive of smoking as a metonym for female depravity. When his wife ushers her out of the room, asserting that to bring a pretty young girl into a house is like placing fresh meat in front of a tiger, it is implied that the script is yet to be instantiated. The story frame blurs the distinction between reality and fiction. 
and between drama, melodrama, and comedy, a blurring which exists throughout the film. When Myung-suk aggressively seduces her employer, the camera offers a glimpse of her naked back, then her feet standing on dong and then her hands as she embraces him. The scene then follows the common convention that sexual activity must be indicated obliquely, but does so as comic hyperbole as the thunderstorm rages outside and lightning sets fire to a tree. Viewers can interpret this as, a, as either a comic overstatement or a warning of approaching catastrophe or both. Im sang su plays with elements of Kim Di Young's elaboration of the script while following his own course. Kim Dong Sik's desperation, I mean, description of the embedded maid is replicated by Bo Hun, the master of the house, but now in a brief speech in which he welcomes the new maid, Uni, by telling her she is an important person because she will be raising his children and cooking his food. The implication that the film will follow a similar trajectory to the original, that is the implication. The suggestion is confirmed when. Uh, Shortly afterwards, Uni flops on her bed at the end of a tiring day in a position isomorphic with that of myung -suk as she lies dead on the stairs after her suicide. Further, because myung -suk is unstable and dangerous, her employment has set up by a workmate as a home invasion designed to destroy the family unit and make dong -sik available. In the 2010 film, the home invasion occupies the final 10 minutes and as Uni enters the house and shatters the family psychologically by her gruesome suicide. Im sang -soo's film may be categorized as a transformed remake. That is, it formally acknowledges its pretext and includes some visual and verbal quotations from it while making substantial changes to characters, to temporal and social setting and to the narrative trajectory uh, the remake cites Kim Gi Young's symbolic use of stairs and doorways. They are signs of the, the married couple's social aspiration, but doesn't attempt to replicate the effect. The dialogue between the two films is most apparent in the appearance of an epilogue in each, but with contrasting effect. Kim's film follows a familiar three-step trajectory normality to disruption, and finally, expression of the disruptive element, which it does in two contrasting versions, the outer frame and the inner story. The idea of a historically and culturally specific normal is clearly an important consideration when comparing versions of a film made 50 years apart. Im sang -soo's housemaid reproduces the three-step structure, but only at story level, uh, not thematically. The epilogue asserts that all members of the family are left mentally unbalanced by the maid's suicide, and so there can be no return to normality, only a new abnormal. Late Autumn belongs to a different kind of remake. The kernel script derives from a holy film, I'll be seeing you, but was modified when remade as a Korean film. The most recent film announces itself to be a remake, but its links to its pretext are more flexible, and there is an intertextual web which involves six preceding flex, um, I mean six preceding uh, films and four countries. So um, later, Atom 2000, uh, 2011 is a loose remake of, of the 1981 film directed by Kim Soo Young and has elaborated the kernel script in different and original ways. Kim Soo Young's film is itself a remake, but because it's pretext, a 1966 film directed by Lee Man Hee has not been preserved. Little is directly known about how Kim Soo Young adapted it, or what uses Lee um, in turn had made of his own pretext, the 1944 Hollywood film, I'll be seeing you. However, comparison of confluences among the four early remakes suggests that Lee's film has been consistently followed and the situation may prompt viewers to seek comparisons among the whole set. Lee added three key plot motifs, 
the manslaughter of the woman's husband, the cultural motivation for the woman's journey, which eliminated her return to sociality central to the Hollywood film, and closure with the failure of the promised twist. The third change transforms a romantic failure to the, uh, I mean, the comedy uh, into a story of a social malaise. That the Hollywood film is humorously referenced in an early scene in late autumn 1981. I saw it in foreign films. They start a conversation with women this way, suggest the scene is based on Lee's transformation of a parallel scene in I'll Be Seeing You. The same scene appears in the Japanese remake, The Rendezvous, 1972. Indeed, numerous similarities between late art in 1981 and the Japanese film indicate places where both are following the 1966 film. There are also other structural similarities with I'll Be Seeing You, but a major difference in addition to a new plot element is that Late autumn 1981 is presented predominantly as focalized by the female protagonist, Nam Herim. Herim's pros uh, perspective is sustained through foregrounded uh, screen time, flashbacks, voiceover expressions of thought, and an extensive narrative use of the visual line without accompanying dialogue. To sum up, uh, that is uh, late autumn 1981, uh, Kim Gi Young's The Promise of the Flesh, uh, The Rendezvous 1972, Late Autumn 1966, and I'll Be Seeing You, um, uh, the, 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 these are the five films are in principle possible pretexts okay, for Late Autumn, uh, not the Late Autumn 19, uh, 2011. Uh, but uh, with a break in continuity, the this film only exists as a trace within the subsequent version, uh, versions, and uh, it seems reasonable to treat late art in 1981 as the effective pretext, while remaining aware that viewers may make intertextual links with, uh, uh, with other possible pretexts. Uh, when Mary, female protagonist of I'll Be Seeing You, tells her story about how her drunken would-be rapist falls to his death, she concludes that she was found guilty of manslaughter because, after all, a man was dead. This sentence has resonated through um, remakes. Over a period of 67 years, the story of, uh, of the female social victim, outcast, has transformed from a spe specifically American narrative about two marginalized people who find redemption through each other in the final year of World War II, through Korean and Japanese stories of toxic masculinity and incipient female resistance in patriarchal societies, and back to America to the rootlessness of diaspora and migrant people. Late autumn 1981 is deeply local, resonating emotionally with the social and political dilemma or trauma of the early 1980s in South Korea. This trauma is embodied in the Korean films in an aversion to physical intimacy, which is associated with domestic violence. The first embrace between Herim and Mingi is interspersed, interspersed with the flashbacks of her husband's violence and the moment she fatally steps in, so her impulse is to flee. Uh, there was... Saramani. Uh, okay. No subtitles available, these are the translations.
when they later embrace and abridge the visual function of the setting is to foreshadow their final separation as it evokes the separated lover's folktale of Kyonu and Jingyeo. The image foreshadows that neither Herring nor Mindy will ever re-enter sociality. Later in 2011, presents an even stronger image of characters stranded forever on the social periphery. In locating the film in a historically and culturally different society and language, 30 years after Kim's late autumn, and 67 years after I'll be seeing you, Kim Taehyung inevitably makes um, substantial innovations. He also uses narrative form differently. For example, he shifts the focus of the mechanism of filling in the gaps by opening the film with the female protagonist killing of her husband, and 50 minutes later introduces a remarkable sequence in which Anna and Hun voice her story while observing an arguing couple. The argument conforms its function as a metafictive comment on the familiarity of the common scripts by modulating into a different genre, a balletic pas de deux. In contrast, the information that Herring in late 1981 killed her husband when she was 26 and has served eight years of a 10 year prison term is pieced together by viewers gradually, starting with a flashback sequence 43 minutes into the film, depicting a scene of domestic violence, which culminates in Harim stabbing her husband with a kitchen knife. This delayed process of disclosure was already present in I'll Be Seeing You, but was there fully explicated, including flashbacks 30 minutes into the film. The most immediate effect in late art 2011 is to change the emotional impact of the representation of the liminality of Anna. Liminality is a motif that pervades the opening sequence of all three films, but is more extreme here. Further, Anna is shown in her prison cell exhibiting stereotypy, uh, here presenting as obsessive teeth cleaning, uh, behavior often found in caged animals and subsequently suggested by her snaking behavior. She seems closer to mental breakdown than the protagonist of earlier films. This behavior together with the washed out, almost black and white palette, reinforces the um, and depiction of Anna's depressed state and her agoraphobic fear and anxiety about a world she has not entered for seven years. A major strategy the film shares with its predecessor is to present substantial pro pro proportions of its narrative, but uh, visually without dialogue, a strategy engages an audience's theory of mind to interpret behavior and thereby prompt some degree of empathic alignment. Interpretation may be shaped by arbitrary association between two films. Viewers seek to identify contrasting homologies between the experiences of individual characters and nat uh, national events or situations, especially if there is a long time lapse between the films. The traumatic events of 1980, the military coup, the Gwangju uprising and its suppression, and the persecution of dissidents cast a shadow on late autumn 1981. The story of a woman on a three-day release from prison who takes an overnight train journey to visit her mother's grave becomes emotionally attached to another traveler and makes a pact to meet him upon her release. In other words, um, she imagined a positive future beyond trauma. The film overtly reflects a common life as is a journey conceptual metaphor in that it is punctuated by images of a moving train. A near contemporary film, Lee Tu Yong's more politically themed The Last Witness, 1980, was extensively cut by the, by the censors, losing about 25% of its running time. Would the awareness of repressive censorship prompt viewers to be alert to the allegorical possibilities of a contemporary film about a woman punished for resisting the brutality of domestic violence and which is substantially concerned with liminality, social exclusion, and trauma? Late autumn 2011 is not a film about Korea. The most extensively re represented uh, ethnic community is culturally hybridized Chinese American, and the principal Korean character, the male protagonist, Hoon, is a gigolo, uh, opportunistic and amoral, preying upon rich Korean women 
discontented with their American husbands. A secondary plot uh, in the film involves the campaign by one such husband to hunt Hun down and destroy him, which is achieved by killing the wife and framing Hun for the murder. This dark image of a fragile and immoral Korean dependence on America is a minor theme in a film about social marginalization and the actors of physical or acts of physical, emotional, and psychological violence they sustain. Such was the theme of the Hollywood romantic comedy, I'll be seeing you 67 years earlier, but that was also the last time this kernel script yielded an outcome imagined to be positive. Once it passed into the domain of the Korean film industry, it became and remains a story of irredeemable loss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those were two excellent presentations that I learned a lot from. Um, we have a little bit of time for a Q&A, so I'm going to go to the Q&A, and I see that there's a question already posed from Mark Raymond. Um, it's uh, uh, addressed to Daniel. It says, do you see films like Train to Busan and heavily digital effects films like Along with the Gods as being related to animation and perhaps even limiting the possibility of a fully animated film crossing over with mainstream audiences at this point? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's something that has been a curious, but perhaps not that surprising phenomenon of um, the recent rise in webtoons in Korea, where for a long time, the, the essential difference between Korea and Japan in terms of the, the animation industries was, I think, connected to the manga culture, where manga is ubiquitous in Japan. It's enjoyed by adults. In Korea, manhwa doesn't have anything like that same level of um, social penetration and is largely seen as a children's thing. I do think that's changing now with webtoons. And you're starting to see now when you get on a train, you know, half the people on the train of all ages are reading webtoons on their phones. But although that's been this, this big kind of boom in, in popularity, anytime a, a Korean, you know, investor or production company thinks this is a popular webtoon, let's turn it into a film. You're right, it's always a live action film even a very special effects heavy live action film like Along with the Gods, it's still you know, reliant on actors and live action cinema for the basis of its appeal. And I don't, I don't quite know, I suppose I do know, but what I would love to see is those webtoons becoming Korean animated feature films or animated uh, TV series, and that's not happening. And even we're seeing that in Japan, Japanese animation is using Korean webtoons as the basis for its stories. But the missing component is why aren't Korean animators using Korean webtoons as the basis for stories? Because they have you know, high visibility, proven appeal. Um, and that's why I would, that's, that's the, the, the penny I'm waiting for to drop is that to see you know, quality feature film animation in Korea based on webtoons. And it hasn't happened yet, and I hope it will. Very interesting. The next uh, question is for Sung A. It's from David Scott Different, uh, who says he loves both presentations. Uh, I agree with that. Um, he writes, uh, do you think that a remake, for instance, Im Sang Su's The Housemaid, makes it possible to quote unquote re-see or see differently the earlier film? For instance, Kim Ki Young's uh, The Housemaid. In other words, does the audience's experience of the original version alter or change or undergo change as a result of watching the more recent version? Okay, thank you, David, for a very good question. It's a really hard question, actually. Um, I can just answer. Uh, this question is the differences between these two movies. Okay, so um, the most recent 2011 film, uh, a lot of people say that the Uni, the protagonist, is is she uh, really a modern woman? Why is she so naive? Um, 
if I compare to her, uh, the, the, the maid in 1960 film, she's very cunning and smart and uh, designing things like that. So, uh, but uh, other thing is uh, at that time, the old uh, film is uh, reflecting uh, their uh, situation there at the time. The, the rural girls comes to uh, the urban area and then became uh, housemaid first and then factory workers and then prostitute. These kind of things are reflected or represented in, in the, the original film. But uh, the original film and the, the more recent film, 2011 film, is depicting, uh, of course, the differences, but then we can see that the degree of discrimination and the situation the maids are in is really quite uh, the worst, the, wor the worsened, if, if I might say. So I, I don't know whether this answers your question, but uh, a lot of things I can say. <laughs> Thank you, David. Sorry. I should also yeah. say that um, I think because the presentations are so good and we've, we're going to go a, a few minutes over. So uh, although officially yeah. the panel is supposed to bend at end at 8, we'll continue until 8.05 because the questions keep coming and they're very good. Um, okay. The next question, uh, again, coming into the Q&A, is for sung -A. Uh, How have archetypes of Korean women changed? What Korean female archetypes is uh, is new these days, and why do you think this archetype has emerged? For example, how has the Me Too movement changed the Korean woman archetype? Uh, I, I think um, I examined a thesis recently about new Korean woman, and then she used the uh, Om um, as a new Korean woman. Uh, but this, uh, again, uh, will be really quite um, a difficult question, but again, uh, sorry, I'm just taking your time. Um, what I'm saying is, uh, it's just a mental block. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's okay. There's actually a question yeah. I saw earlier um, in the chat, actually, that was posted to Daniel, and I'm going to use it because I, I, it was something yeah. that occurred to me as well. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, he writes, um, or the author writes, uh, Dear, thanks, Daniel, for a wonderful presentation. As talked, Japanese anime developed orderless materials to appeal to both national and global audiences. One of the major reasons for this is because they learned animation from both the US and Germany. Korean animation, however, develops several orderless products focusing on national identities. And then to the question, can you explain why the Korean animation industry is different from the Japanese case in this regard? That's something that occurred to me as well. Um, okay, that's a really good question. And um, if you're only giving us like three more minutes, then I'm not sure I can answer it in any kind of adequate way. <laughs> um, the first thing I would say is that I, I, I don't really buy the, 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 the cultural odorless theory that says that that's why Japanese animation is so successful. I think it was certainly true for a certain generation um, of Japanese animation going around the world, you know, like thing like Astro Boy in the 1960s. I think it did succeed because it was so easy to just, you know, slap on a layer of local culture to it and then it would make sense to any audience. But I think at least since the 1980s, um, we've seen a really vibrant mix. There has been animation that doesn't feel very Japanese, achieving massive popular in Japan. There has been animation that does feel very Japanese in very striking ways, achieving widespread um, acclaim all around the world. So I, I think in the case of Japan, it's, it's really not that helpful to oversimplify um, that question. In Korea, um, I mean, I think in your question, you're right. There's this, this the protective uh, sensibility. I mean, Robot Tech One V was made as a direct response to this um, collective cultural anxiety. Korean children were watching um, a Japanese giant robot series called Mazinga Z. It was widely adored by uh, Korean kids and. Koreans just suddenly felt like this, we, what, what, what are we letting to happen here? We cannot let Japanese culture influence our youth. And so shamelessly, but also brilliantly, they took the exact same robot design, slapped a V on its chest, gave it Taekwondo and said, 
we're going to completely redeploy this as a hyper patriotic, super nationalist um, action adventure for children. And it worked brilliantly. It achieved everything they wanted it to. And I think, I think that is when Korean animation is most successful at home, is when it understands that it can offer something to local audiences that they won't be getting from foreign animation. And that's, I think, what is too often overlooked um, in the industry. And that's why there have been so many failures. Um, they're failures of imagination as well, I think. If fantastic. Question. No, that's a fantastic answer. Um, okay, so yeah, I think it is uh, close to time. And given that the next panel is supposed to start at 810, I think we should wrap this one up. I, again, I, I really enjoyed both the presentations. I hope the audience did as well. I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, thank you for attending. I'm going to sing Jude's going to take over. Thank you, Daniel, for excellent moderation. All right. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation. So this is a wrapping thank up you. of today first panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, there are several more questions, but I can send uh, those questions to both of you. Um, those are questions and comment, so probably will be a bit helpful. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful uh, panel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Okay, good evening, um, good afternoon, or good morning, everyone from all across the globe. Welcome back to the fourth panel of the South Korean Film Industry Conference. Um, and this is the second panel of today's event. Uh, my name is Iris Son, and I'm very honored uh, to chair tonight's panel. So, so far, we have seen wonderful discussions about rich history of South Korea's film policy and industry from more social, political, and economic perspectives. And this panel, under the title Film Culture, moves on to discuss the cultural significance of the film industry uh, with three wonderful speakers. So today's discussions uh, will include the formation of star image during the early 21st century, and uh, affective or ethical challenges to film genre and aesthetics with regard to the Cold War regime in South Korea, and um, the Korean Film Archives Restoration Project and its implication in Korean nation cinematic identity, I mean, I mean, Korean cinema's national identity. So I'll give an introduction to each speaker before each presentation. And after the presentations, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A window on Zoom. So our first presenter is Dr. No Kwangu. So Dr. No has a master's degree of cinema studies from New York University and doctoral degree of mass communication and media arts at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Um, he has actively published um, research papers as well as film reviews and very I mean, prolific in public writing as well and has worked at several film festivals in South Korea and beyond. So he's currently teaching uh, cinema and media studies at colleges in Korea. And his presentation today uh, will discuss the star image of Song Kang-ho, who has happened to become by now among the most popular Korean actors for his performance in Parasite. The title of Dr. No's presentation is Song Kang-ho, a star of new Korean cinema. Please welcome Dr. No. OK. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Yeah. but. Uh... Okay, let's make some correction. Uh, I never been in the film. Uh, actually, uh, I was uh, some involved in some South Korean animation festival in 2020 uh, century, but mostly I was involved in the North, Kore uh, North American Korean film festival, such as the New York Korean film festival or uh, the Co Korean festival, in, uh, film festival in Canada. So anyway, yeah, that doesn't matter. And then, uh, most of all, uh, even though I have uh, the doctoral degree, that's my identity is just a, uh, just uh, the movie pen. Yeah, and uh, as a movie pen, uh, I made this proposal that because I found some interesting patterns and then the some the element in the Song Kang acting and then his movies. And then the, mostly we, until now, mostly we focused on the, the, the text analysis or the, the examined the, the policy or the, the industry. But uh, how can I say, it was very rare to examine the star image or the stardom of Korean actors and actresses. So that's why I tried to uh, make this the examination. Anyway. Let's uh, share the, my. Uh, so do you see? 
do you see the the my the, the plate okay the star study itself is related to uh, the star system of stardom is the key point of the popular content i guess and uh, sometimes the stars and actors and actresses work as a persona over some film director and then they the kind of the function the, the as a sometimes the cultural icon over some period or the generation and these books are the famous books of the star studies the upper one is the original english text and the low ones are korean translations which i read the read a long time ago Anyway, the Edgar Morin, the Richard Dyer, and the Christine Glad here they published these books and then they invited us to, to do some the insight uh, about uh, the star phenomenon. Uh, okay, skip this one. And uh, the, the, we can see, the, for example, we can see this kind of the example of a star and their affiliation with some director and the young or the generation, uh, John Wayne and uh, John Ford, mostly they work in the Western genre. And Humphrey Bogart is known for his uh, detective image in the film noir. And then Jean Paul Belmondo and Jean Pierre Leo is the kind of icon of the French New Way. Uh, uh, in terms of the American film, uh, Danny Sopo and Austin Hoffman was the kind of the the representative represented 1960s the American new cinema and then baby boom generation. Uh, in East Asia, the, we can see the, how the Bungli worked in the fifth generation. And the Chinese filmmakers. So now we is our turn to examine the Korean actors in this the global. Um, before we examine the, the Song Kang Ho's image, I introduce some the famous the actors in each the period. For example, Kim Sung Ho, the one in the upper right side. Uh, Kim Kim Sung Ho was known for his image of a traditional father who lost his authority in the modernization in the 1950s. And Shin Song Il, the left one, uh, he was a symbol of urban Korean youth in the 1960s. The, he, he, the, one of the, his nickname is the, the Emperor of Youth. Yes, the, he the represents the Korean youth in 1960s and 1970s. And the An Song Gi, yes. An Song Gi the, portrayed the Korean men's alienation and more adjustment, rapid social transformation in the 1980s. So that's the kind of the uh, example of the Korean males. And, okay, back to Parasite. Uh, the movie was itself very interesting when I watched this film, but I found I was not impressed by Song Kang Ho's acting. Uh, that gave me a question: Why I was not uh, impressed by his acting? And I found he may, uh, maybe he just uh, repeated his role in which he took the, in his former films. So, uh, in this film, he his character is a Kite. He is the comic, good-hearted and unsuccessful, unsuccessful father of the 50 years old. And he has a wife, a son, and daughter. That is the kind of the typical image of a Korean nuclear family. And in the scene of the holding the pizza box as a family business, uh, he showed his clumsiness. But later, when the Q, his son, Q's the friend brought uh, the Bolger stone as a present. He recognized this uh, this uh, the meaning of the Bolger stone. It means he has a discerning eye, and he 
it is the kind of the sign of his educatedness. So once he was the middle class and white color, or he got the traditional style of education. That's why he was not fitted to the modern situation. And as the story, the process, the progress, uh, it is revealed he was a red op and he had a, tried to have a lot of the, the ops, like a designated draft for drunken men, or so he was involved in the small business, uh, like the Taiwanese King Castera the bakery. Yeah, it was once very popular in Korea, but suddenly it collapsed. Anyway, the, this film, he showed uh, the Kitte character is the synthesis of his film characters and modern middle-aged Korean man's suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, Song kang -ho, the he was born in 1967 uh, and he debuted in the mid-1990s. The 1990s is the period that the 1980s generation, we call the 3A6, once I, we call the 3A6 generation, now we call the 5A6 generation and for the society. So in 1990s, he was kind of the newbie or the rookie. Uh, in, in, in his early career, uh, he got a small role in the day when a pig fell into, fell into a well. Yeah, Hong Chang Su's first film. But uh, maybe you missed uh, the, his presence because he, his part was uh, too small to recognize. Anyway, uh, he was not uh, uh, noticed that in the time. But <clears throat> the, in Yi Chang Dong's debut film, Green Fish, he take the a much bigger role, but still small. And uh, in this in this film, he showed uh, the realistic reenactment of low life gangster. If you see it, the upper picture, he you may recognize his face. He is stand behind the Muntongun, and then he got a popular not uh, notice uh, through. Tong Nung 1997 film number three. Uh, in this film, he showed a, a comic gangster to be obsessed with power and hierarchy. Hmm? And then the Kim Ji-yun's 1997 film, he got the role of a comic and absurd nephew in the family of a remote villa. In 1998, he got the, the supporting role in the Kang jae smash hit film, The Shiri. And in this film, an elite agent, he got the role of elite agent of National Information Service. Uh, but the different from his, uh, his persona, the comic persona of in the number three in Quiet Family was tweaked. So uh, the audience did not think the, he took a fitted role in this film. So how uh, the let's the back go to the feet of 1980s generation. Uh, as I said, they were once called the 3A6 generation in mid-1990s and early 2000s. And in the time, they are the rookie and the rising force. Uh, in terms of their age, they are 30s, and they got college education in 90, 1980s. And mostly, they are born in 1960s. So they, their school days are filled uh, in their school days, they experienced the military dictatorship of Park jong and Chun Doan's presidency. So that kind of the, the experience made them have strong antipathy to authoritarianism and the yearning for the democracy. Yeah, this kind of the sensibility is rebuilt and represents a democratic value in some Song Kang films. And now they are called 5A6 generation. 
mostly they are the 50s. And they are ridiculed by the young the MZ generation. The famous the term is the latte sauce. Uh, it is the Korean term for when I was uh, young as you. Yeah, this generation kind of the maker try to give some lesson to young generation. And they begin with this term. When I was young as you, I experienced the, the hardship. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Oh, this is the, the, again, the idiom for ridicule, right? And the generation. I will uh, discuss it later. And uh, the big shock to this generation was uh, 1997 IMF crisis. And the, uh, this the economic uh, crisis the influenced the kind of the representation of a timid, anxious, and desperate father who lost his authority. Ah, this kind of the this is the typical image of a father in the Korean popular films. Okay, go to the Song Kang-ho's career. Uh, he took the first reading role in the Kim Ji-won's Foul King in 2000. Uh, in this film, he took the role of a salary man at the local bank. And uh, his character he was a powerless ordinary single man who lives with his father. Uh, he was in this film, he, his character was shy and timid, and he was always abused by his boss. Uh, under the situation, he had a fantasy of being champion on the wrestling arena. And that represents the weakness of middle class and white collar workers at the Asian economic crisis of 1997. Mm -hmm. And Park Chan joint security area. In this film, he took the role of a considered North Korean soldier to hide the secret of a murder case. And uh, this, the considered North Korean soldier, is a positive and humanistic image show positive and humanist image of North Korea in post-Cold War situation. And that is the one top-breaking the, top -breaking the moment of North Korean image in Korean, South Korean cinema. Hmm? And the uh, Bong Joon-ho's Memories of Murder, uh, he took the role of a local cop who is faced with an unprecedented serial murder case. And uh, at the end of the film, he finally uh, failed to solve the case. And uh, his failure represents the modernization and defeat of ideally local community. And it showed kind of the moral adjustment or build the accommodation to the transition from agricultural community to more anonymous society. And so you can see his frustration, frustration of uh, this uh, traditional guy on the, uh, the Song Kang-ho space now. After that, he usually took the weak and the devastated father role. The first one was Park uh, chan Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. Uh, in this film, his character was a divorced engineer whose business failed during the IMF crisis. Uh, in this film, the, his daughter was abducted and accidentally died. So the angry at that uh, her, his daughter's death, he decided to get the revenge and he became a very brutal, very cruel. Mm -hmm. Uh, Im Chan Sang's The President Barber, he took the role of a powerless father try to save his disabled son in the 1960s and 1970s military dictatorship. Uh, uh, at the end of the film, the, after Park Jong hee died, his son recovered. Yeah, that is the kind of the ending of this film. But uh, in the, the second half of this film, he, uh, the image was the film is mostly filled with his effort or his struggle to save his son. Hmm? 
And the Bong Joon-ho's 2007 film, he showed a clumsy and absurd father. Uh, he was involved in a small business, small business with his experienced father, a younger sister, a younger brother, and his, do uh, his daughter. Uh, in this film, there, there is no wife, so he is represented as a single dad. And as, as you see the film, you already know, he failed to save his daughter from the monster. Uh, continuously, he took the robot, the divorced father. Huh? And uh, Chang Hoon's secret reunion, he took the role of a lead performer, secret agent. Uh, in this film, uh, he's, he also divorced and his ex-wife and one daughter live in England. So he, he, so he wanted to make a kind of the family reunion after he the, accumulated enough money. And uh, it represented, uh, in the time, in Korea society, there was at the term a goose father, Kiroki Appa. A goose father means a middle-aged man to work hard to pay his son or daughter's expensive living expense and tuition who stay in the Western countries, like the United States or the England or somewhere else. Anyway, in this film, he make a teamwork with the former North Korean agent for private bounty hunting. And this film, in terms of genre, this is the kind of the body movie, and it uh, emphasized the brotherhood, North Korea and South Korea, and the men who tried to uh, recover his the family order, their family order. Uh, his father image is expanded or maybe exploited in later films. A father within political turmoil. Yang Wusok's film, The Attorney, uh, that film modeled the late Rumyeon, our the president, from 2002 to 2007. Uh, in this film, the, the Song Kang took the role of the a lawyer uh, who experienced a transition from an ordinary lawyer to a human rights defender. And as a kind of the, the he, in this film, he tried to defend the innocent college students against the political conspiracy. Uh, partially, his devotion is related to his sense of responsibility of the father. Chang Hoon's the taxi driver, uh, he took the role of an ordinary taxi driver, and he is also the single dad who brought the German reporter Wilgen Hinchiteko to Gwangju in 1980. His mm -hmm. uh, father role was reused, frequently used in, even in the historical dramas. In 2013, the Hanjae the face reader, he took the role of a fictional fortune teller in Archduke Suyang Sukup in uh, 1453, there was the one, the, one of the, the famous uh, royal coup in the, the Joseon dynasty. Uh, in this, he, again, his role was a father who failed to protect his son against the unjust political authority. That is the kind of the typical role of the Song Kang Ho, a father who try to protect his son or daughter from disaster, monster, or the big, the, the unjust political power. But there is some the, the, the change in the Ijunik's throne, the 2014 film. It, it is the story about King Yongjo and his son, the crown priest Sado in 18th century. Uh, it is the famous classical audible tradition in Joseon dynasty. In this film, 
the crown prince Sado was framed and he the, was the accused for his the effort of coup d'etat. So the, the, the King Yongjo uh, ordered him to go into a box and he died in the box. No? So in the superficial level, he is the, uh, his role was a father who failed to protect his son in political turmoil. But the difference is he is the, in other films, he, his father was a powerless, ordinary. But in this film, the king is a powerful, rich, and experienced. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was the, the Ijunik's intention or not, but even though it is unintentional, it showed struggle between 5S6 generation and MZ generation. Mm -hmm. And it also showed we can interpret it as the, the limit and incapability of a five a six generation. Even they have a social power, even they have a authority, they could not protect their son. They could not protect their next generation. Uh, that is the kind of the implication of this, this film. Uh, mostly, uh, he worked with these four directors, Kim ji Gong Bong Joon-ho, Park chan -ho, and Chang Hoon. Hmm? In Kim ji Yoon's film, he, his role is the rather the comic anarchist and the yearning for pro uh, he, he was yearning for freedom. Paul King, the good and the, the bad and the weirdo, and even in the age of shadow. In Bong Joon-ho's film, Usually he took the role of plumbed and timid, timid one. Post and the parasite is the, the example. Park chan film, he showed a kind of the breaking taboo. He was involved in breaking social or political taboo. JSA, sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and the thirst. Uh, in the thirst, the, he took the role of the Catholic father who became the vampire. And he was romantically involved with one, the, another, the female vampire. Uh, in Chang Hoon's film, Chang Hoon used Song Kang as a single dad in a body movie and road with the Chang Hoon Convention, secret reunion, and a taxi driver. Hmm? So uh, these are examples of his on Song Kang was unsuccessful films. The King's Letter, the Song Kang took the role of the King Taejong, and Howling, Yuha's film. In this, in this film, he took the role of the Aweary Cop. And the Hindsight, Leon's film, he took the role of the retired gangster. Uh, in these films, the, there is the, no code of the fatherhood. Huh? So the audience were not accustomed to or this kind of the image of Song Kang Ho. Song Kang Ho is not, Song Kang Ho is not father. That was kind of unfamiliar for the Korean audience. So, the, okay, we already talked about the, his, the cinematic character and the genre enough. So, he, in his film, filmography, we can find the, we find no romance film or melodrama. Usually he was represented as a single dad, or even though he, had, he has a wife, uh, he was not, uh, he did not show his romantic interest in his wife. That is the kind of weak point. Maybe the, the limit of, the, of his, uh, Let me image. Uh, now you can take this one as a kind of the appendix for the kind of the star image the comparison. I uh, I I read some the the American the leftist critics the book on the analyzing the male image of the Hollywood action films, 
uh, mostly in the film, the Hollywood uh, the action stars uh, take the, took the role of the sheriff or vigilant to protect the community. And they the represent as a man with a gun and a hard body in the 1980s. Joe's the Death West series or Die Hard series are example. In these films, the, the representation of the middle-aged man is, uh, implies uh, conservatism and militarism in terms of the ideology. But in Korean dramas, uh, these uh, the powerless Korean middle-aged father and single dad or, or the man who failed to keep his family order uh, their struggle to protect their son or the, their, the victimization is affiliated with liberalism. Liberalism or kind of the leftist the sensibility in Korea. Uh, further examination, okay. Uh, even though I focus on the, the image of Song Kang Ho, maybe if you are interested in the, the star image studies, you can take uh, these the male actors and or the female actors for your own study. Uh, the right side is uh, mostly the, the macho men. Uh, they are not uh, engaged in the romantic heterosexual relationship. But uh, in the left side, Han Seok Kyu, Lee Byung Hun, Lee Jung Jae, blah blah blah. This kind of the men is the they are uh, the very handsome, and then they, uh, in their films, they are the engaged in the, the romantic relationship. Uh, and female stars. Uh, most Korean films are very male-centered, and the women are marginalized. So it's hard to do the analyze the female stars image. But uh, these the female stars may be worth the, the examination. Mesu is the icon of the Korean glamorous, and the Son Yejin is the queen of the romantic comedy, and Ha Ji Won is the action queen. Mostly he involved, he, she is involved in the many the action related the film, the sports film or the, the uh, fist fighting film kind of that. And John Jeon also famous for her the, the, the diverse image of the romance, comedy, and action. Okay, now I think I uh, I'm done with my presentation, so I the, the I will yield the turn to the other presenters. Okay, uh, Dr. Son, the, the you can uh, yield the, the chance to the other presenters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for um, your wonderful presentation. Um, so our next speaker is Ariel Shesson. Um, Ariel Shesson is an independent film scholar and moving image archivist. Uh, she has worked in film exhibition, journalism, and film festivals. And she's the founder of this podcast series, Archivist Alley, such a very, I mean, intriguing name. Um, so as a podcasterist, she is well known within the U.S. Um, film preservation and restoration community for advocating inclusion of archivists of color and for pushing for acknowledgement of the marginalized, especially BIPOC moving image materials. Um, she has earned two master's degrees at UCLA, one for cinema and media studies and the other for moving image archivists, archive studies uh, with her expertise in archival process of restoration. Um, Shesson will present tonight about the cultural implication of the Korean Film Archive's recent film restoration project. The title of her talk is Real Heritage, Restoration, Repatriation, and National Film Identity in the Korean Film Archive. Please join me in welcoming Ariel Shetson. My name is Ariel Shetson, and um, you know about me now, but um, please take these as um, sort of a, that my slides are sort of an introduction to what I will be saying. Um, there's sort of a, a guideline. Um, so that's that's just sort of that. Uh, most of the important stuff is what I will be saying. To a lay person or someone with limited archival experience, um, the phrase, um, the phrase film restoration 
might be limited, might be specific enough to uh, project on its own reels, so to speak. In the strictest and most technical of definitions, it is a pres preservation process done to return damaged, deteriorated, or somehow injured moving image materials to a condition as close as possible to the state they were in before the damage took place. These injuries could have been made by time, film diseases such as vinegar syndrome, or simply poor care or, and bad storage. The process is complicated, uh, especially now that we're in the di digital age and the vast majority of our films are being restored digitally. Uh, not that digital is, doesn't have its problems, Every restoration, whether photochemical or digital, changes the work in some capacity. This is, of course, the intention. Uh, since it presumably started in an unacceptable state, these changes to film materials lead us to more theoretical conversations, such as discussions about film ownership and alteration intent. Would a now dead creator have wanted the film to look this way? Um, who decides? And who should be making these changes? Where and to whom does this film actually belong? While acknowledging that film restoration is an individuated physical process, we can accept its flexibility as a discursive category. Film restoration connects archiveness with history, national identity, and a larger, um, a larger concept of preservation that is literally based on, upon restoring films physically to archives that colonialism may have destroyed. This is where my discussion on the history of the Korean film archive comes in. The delineation between uh, Korean film archives from now on, known as COFA, um, and many other archives, is that the idea of physical film recovery can also be considered a kind of restoration. It is cultural and historical film restor restoration for a country whose decades and decades of trauma and abuse affected their film industry and ability to create a viable film preservation space. So let us begin with an examination of how COFA came into existence because it certainly has an, a unique origin story. Film archives generally begin with their lives as pretty straightforward preservation establishments. While this may be COFA's identity now, it certainly wasn't how they began. Park Chung-hee, uh, president of Korea from 1963 until 1979, had a certain interest in film. Sadly, it was not the kind of interest that equates to culturally positive, uh, celebratory, preservation-y support. Then again, Park Chung-hee had no chill. Uh, beginning his leadership of South Korea versus, uh, via military dictatorship, Park was eventually assassinated because of that zero chill factor. All jokes in the miracle at Han River defense put aside, Park Chung-hee was a fascist and anything other than authoritarianism was not high on his grocery list. The thing is, film preservation did have a history in Korea. The film community was dynamic. Filmmakers, critics, and journalists participated in events reaching all the way back to the 1930s. Festivals and events had reached out to the public about memorabilia and other film materials to see what could, have been, what could be used for these actual events. Uh, Korean film professionals had realized at that point that a major part of celebrating what they had accomplished in the silent era at that point, at that uh, very at that point, was preservation, and that many things had already disappeared. By the 
so by the time Park Chung Hee came around, well, colonialism, wars, conflict, even more of those materials were gone. So what does this have to do with the Korean archive, film archive, besides like everything? Well, by the mid seventies, North Korea had a strong film archive that was doing a lot of press preservation work and belonged to the oldest archiving organization in the world, the International Film Archives Federation, from now on known as FIOF. Kim Jong-il was a massive film fan and scholar. He wrote books about film preservation and films. So it actually made a lot of sense. Uh, I actually have it on good authority that he was a huge Donald Duck fan and that the archives in North Korea are really something to behold. I have colleagues who have been there many times. Uh, Kim Chiyun, a member of Park Chung-hee's Ministry of Culture and Public Information, had gone on a business trip to the Berlin Film Festival. While, there, while he was there, he ended up meeting with a member of FIAF. He made the very maddening discovery that Nor North Korea had a better film archive that, than South Korea, who at that point had no film archive at all. Kim was also the director of the Motion Picture Promotion Corporation, which was part of Park Chung-hee, the Ministry of Culture and Public Information. And being so, he decided to propose membership to FIAF when he returned. As Hyun Kim states in her excellent piece on pre film preservation during the Cold War, Kim saw FIAF as a venue for Korean policymakers and film directors to interact with leaders of other film libraries, possibly generating more chances to enhance South Korea's reputation in other countries. Going into the film library, the film membership, the, the original idea was not actually to have um, an archive, but they were gonna build a, li a library because libraries were very much the thing at the time. And the library sounded much more reasonable and a lot more realistic than have an archive. Uh, a lot of people at that time had film libraries uh, and people were writing a lot about film. So there was a lot of written literature. So film libraries seemed a lot more doable. On the other hand, the desire to uh, extend more diplomatic relationships uh, to other film professionals around the world and to, to give the, the Korean film industry a sort of facelift from the current negative global image that it had mostly by given to them by the US occupation who had uh, given them the image that they were backward and that they were um, uh, somehow third class, uh, go USA for occupation and bad self image. Uh, so to turn that around, um, they, just wanted to do this FIAF thing because they thought that would be a much better idea. So they quickly engineered a structure, a physical structure that would qualify um, as an archive under FIAF rules and regulations. And then they applied uh, for membership in 1974. However, they were only able to achieve what is known as observer status, which is not full membership. Um, this was based on a, on a few pretty significant things, um, such as like a real archive um, or what, what they thought, of, what FIOF start, thought of as like a real archive. Um, they didn't have film vaults. That's pretty, pretty big. Or like trained technicians. So these things were kind of, kind of big. So they only got observer status at first. Um, and they only uh, got observer status for, you know, they had that for 10 years. So that was a big thing. These are some things that these are FIOF actual documents of what an archive is. Um, and these were like some of the rules and regulations and um, 
they're, I, I think they're pretty, um, you know, interesting, but they're very old school, um, like FIOF was. FIOF was a very old school organization. So uh, anyway, COFA was gr finally granted full membership in the mid 80s. Part of me is very allergic to the idea that any regular bo regulatory body would place someone in a subservient position or category due to their lack of basic needs. Uh, it certain ge certainly gels with who FIOF and film preservation groups were at the time, however. Uh, over, the over the years, many archiving groups uh, have been able to recognize that they are not only engaging with history, but with memory and with real people, thus becoming more inclusive and welcoming. Unfortunately for the film archiving profession, most of our um, large organizations have really dragged their feet in this area. In the 10 years that I have been in the profession, I've seen a very few changes. It's taken until the last maybe one or two years. Um, it's still incredibly difficult for any non-Western uh, or non-white moving image centered archive to achieve the recognition it deserves or the help or support it needs from our more established associations or groups. I looked through every FIAF um, like uh, magazine, they have an established journal and there were basically no articles on COFA and that was really shocking to me. Calling out respected organizations and professions for privilege and gatekeeping is complex, but it is necessary. We should, be, we should begin to re realize that we can think on multiple levels and not just, just with the kind of binary good, bad that we have been trained with. We'll, while we recognize and appreciate the powerful organizations that have, play, that have played in the creation of these moving, ar moving image archives, and the profession, we can also critique them for dropping the ball when it comes to certain responsibilities that they had in the representation of the international film communities uh, through their organization. With this, and the recognition that organizations play gatekeeper far too much, we can move on to talking to about the conversation I had with those at COFA. When I met with Osanji of the research and curation team, we spoke with we spoke about the connections between the Korean film industry and why there is a deep need to foster the relationship between film archives and industries. Looking at COFA, considering Phil, Korea's incredible film losses over the years, collections of costumes, scripts, posters, or ephemera, they're all quite valuable. Archives, specifically film archives, are great resources, but pe most people just aren't aware of it or the ability that they can go use them at any time. Our deeper conversations also looked at the role of the curator and how integral that is to the archive, the museum, theatrical exhibitions, and the public image. My interviews with preservationist Kim ki -ho, shed new light on the way that restoration and preservation is treated at COFA. We discussed various projects such as the repar re repatriations from the, and I'm gonna completely mess up the pr pronunciation of this, Nya Tonga uh, Sound and Vision Institution, Institute from New Zealand. I was particularly curious about the Lee Man He uh, film um, that was returned to COFA from Nyatanga. So we went into that work's Im importance in contradistinction to other identified prints of, this, of the same film. Preservationist Kim provided great knowledge and very unique perspectives on COFA and film restoration in general, and specifically why Korean film restoration, individual and archival restoration on the whole are critical. I interviewed Eric Choi, who, like Osanji, is on the research and curation team. 
but he was the overseas acquisitions manager at Kofa for five years and had to do some really wild things to find certain titles. His job involved researching Korean films and looking through different national and international film databases, forums, and private collector groups to see if any of them would appear there. If, by some chance, the desired title or titles were to appear, he would make contact with the holder and see what the condition or status of the film was, find out more information on it, and go from there. It is a monster of a job. And add the fact that many films have name changes due to oh, censorship, country release, year of release, someone's mood, alternative cut, or I don't know, insert reason here. Fun times, right? You've heard of extreme sports. Well, acquisitions, and especially something like what Eric and I spoke about, could be considered extreme preservation, the research variety. Talking with Eric about his research methods and finding and ways of finding films was probably one of the most exciting experiences, mostly because there have been actual concrete results, and they are such positive results. Speaking to Sarah Davey from the Niatonga Sound and Vision Institute, she was absolutely delighted to tell me about the repatriation experience she shared with Eric at Kofa and the material and all the materials they returned to South Korea. These items had originated with film collectors, with actual film collectors in New Zealand. They were being housed at Niatonga, and Sarah and her team negotiated a very smooth transaction. Nyatonga Sound and Vision Institute is an archive that really believes in the power of cultural heritage and cultural heritage space. My conversation with Sarah and her joy at being able to restore these items to Kofa was a powerful example of how archives can work as a community for, for our culturally critical moving image materials. Repatriations are literally one archiving asking one archive asking another archive to please give me that because it actually belongs to us. Uh, so they're kind of complicated transactions. Sometimes they work perfectly because archives need space, and so they're like, "Oh yeah, this is taking up space. Please have it." Um, but there's lots of complicated reasons and, and it's just, it can get very, very dicey. Um, but for the most, for the most part, due to the community part of archive community, um, a lot of good does ha actually happen. Um, but the idea of ownership or non-ownership is worth bringing up. It is also worth bringing up the idea of cultural heritage and returning, restoring, colonized materials. Whether or not we know or whether people want to recognize, yeah, I'm looking at you, British Museum, how these items arrived at their current location. We know their provenance, and that is the most important part of the equation. By focusing on the practice of acquisitions and film re repatriation and using these real world examples from archives in addition to archival literature that is centered on repatriation ar ar arguments, Kofa's positionality in the archival community can be better comprehended. Drilling down into archival discussions on orphan films, film ownership, cultural heritage, and national meaning, the rhetoric of moving images and their home becomes a source of a very important conversation. These conversations open up the not always comfortable examinations of and about archival privilege and valid arguments made about what acquisitions and repatriation mean for Asian and South Asian ar archives, specifically Korea. 
For many Asian South Asian archives, repatriation is a way of literally getting their moving history back. As Sam Ho notes, Asian archives face daunting tasks once they are set up. The late, the late start of the preservation movement needs huge quantities of cinematic treasures have already been lost before the archives begin even looking for them. Ho also mentions Hong Kong who, just like Korea, began their journey to archivehood in the 1970s. Unlike Korea, Hong Kong had to wait until 1993 to become an official archive. What is the significance of this? Well, many Korean films have been found in Hong Kong. These links, this community matters. On a global level, all archives do the same kind of labor to hopefully achieve the same results. But on a larger level, what cannot be ignored is that the histories of each archive and their national cinemas are unique. This fact causes the reasons behind repatriation requests from each country to differ. Those countries that have lived under colonialism, militarism, et cetera, like Korea, become thicker with meaning. Those requests carry a cultural weight and historical responsibility that needs to be listened to. That doesn't mean that Western country-based requests are not important. It simply means that they pack different baggage. Western archives have historically been colonizers, not the colonized. So within the archival landscape, this is something that must be examined. So yes, this is certainly a conversation that is being started so that we can look at and question archival privilege. And it's time to listen. And thank you. That's my, that's what I'm going to be uh, looking at. And um, there we go. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation, Ariel Shasin. Um, so tonight's final panel, uh, tonight's final, uh, um, tonight's final speaker is Professor Hyesung Chung. Um, professor Hyesung Chung is Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at Colorado State University. And she's an established scholar of Korean cinema in the Anglophone world. Um, she has published highly monumental books, including Hollywood Asian, um, Kim ki Dog, and Hollywood Diplomacy. And she also has co-authored um, Movie Migration with David Scott Defriant. Another uh, book she co-authored with Defriant is forthcoming this summer mm -hmm. entitled Movie Minorities. I'm really looking forward to reading it. So today, Dr. Chang will present about the film censorship and its production of a cheerful modern Korean cinema under the title, Creating a Cheerful Cinema, South Korea's um, Cold War Regimes and State Film Censorships. Okay, thank you, Dr. Song. Um, we are really running out of time, but I do want to um, really, um, I do want you to thank, um, I do want to thank uh, all, the, all the organizers and I actually um, joined a little bit late. I'm, I'm a replacement for my mentor, uh, Dr. Catherine McHugh, who were not able to uh, um, present her material. So um, I'll be recycling some of the papers I've written for another conference. Um, actually, the title is a little bit different uh, beyond anti-communism and national propaganda cultural film censorship as a collaborative process of cultural regulation. So if I just go on about censorship, actually, some of my, um, one of my former student Jason is here, I will just talk like one hour talking about Hollywood censorship because that's my favorite topic to teach, like an uh, area I was um, trained at UCLA and a lot of archival research. So what I'm bringing is uh, my knowledge of Hollywood film censorship. Um, I'm trying to kind of apply that, the knowledge I gained through archival research, really intensive archival research, not only in Hollywood archive, but also Washington National Archives. So I define regulation in a very different context, uh, including um, Dep Department of Defense or State Department, how they got involved, US US government branches got involved in Hollywood production. They're not really censorship in a strict level, but in Hollywood censorship, it's taken for granted. Hollywood censorship studies, it's not necessarily negative things. It's, it's a dialogical, it's like Foucauldian um, understanding of censorship. So like, if you just apply that, 
how how new censorship, um, whether that's internal censorship within the industry or external regulation by the foreign governments or or the states states with censorship board or or cities with censorship board or local censorship, how that really increase productivity rather than decrease. So this is a kind of a, like if you 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 cannot do something, then you have to find a way to creatively circumvent. So that's the kind of idea about censorship increasing productivity, this is taken for granted in Hollywood censorship studies. But unfortunately in um, Korean film censorship studies is always you know, the oppression, state oppression versus resistance, cultural resistance, that paradigm was uh, very much uh, there. And I actually went to the Centennial Conference, Korean, stud Korean film studies and cent Centennial Conference, there's always this talk um, on cultural producer. Yeah, the Korean cinema became really great after 1997 when state censorship became un unconstitutional. This type of uh, narrative is very much entrenched. And actually uh, in, in Hollywood censorship studies, the opening of a censorship document, that was a turning point when PCA, PCA is a production code administration, so they are internally regulated. So production code administration, the internal regulator, they were actually consolidators. They actually represented all the other censorship board concerns <laughs> and they communicated cent central like agency, they communicated with producers and they are their own um, production code at the, the text censorship code, but that's based on all the other censorship boards demands, whether that's the religion, sex or violence or profanity or, or cultural representation of foreign nationals or race. So like British censorship board or Memphis censorship board or Kansas censorship board or Chicago censorship board, you know, for American, any American, single American film to be exhibited, you have to go through all these censorship board. So production code administration in Hollywood, there was a central office. So when we apply this to Korean context, we're going to talk about Ministry of uh, in Public Information, later Ministry of uh, Culture and Public Information, because except for America, all the other countries, in you know, all the other countries, government centralized, government actually censored films, unlike uh, America. In America, it was self-regulation was uh, principle. So, when this open, the censorship um, document open, I actually I asked my students to um, study this and, and they actually figure out, although American students are generally against censorship, they actually understand why censorship was productive for, for financial reason. And that their, um, the censorship document opened in 1983, that was turning point. That's when really scholars understood actually the productive nature of censorship. Before that, obviously American scholars imagined censorship only in oppressive term, uh, that's the infringement of freedom of expression. But when actually they look at the document and look at the day-to-day, -day, you know, operation between regulator and the regulated pro producers, they understood why censorship was productive. So um, one of our organizer, uh, Mr. Jo Jun Young, I owe a lot to him. And he really pioneered uh, this new scholarship based on this document. And unfortunately, Korean Film Archive had this document, but did not really made it public until 2016. And now we can um, go to Korean Film Archive reference room and, and uh, Mr. Joe will help me uh, access this document. And this was really turning point of our censorship studies. I'm so excited about this, <laughs> this that we can now look at the document and actually you, you can really break a lot of myths about censorship. And obviously uh, Mr. Joe's um, own um, scholarship, he uh, edited this volume. And I think he put it really well here because there was always conflation of the larger macro political oppression during the authoritarian regime from the 60s and 80s. Conflation of that <laughs> macro oppression with the cultural policy um, of regulators, regulators who were just mid-level employees of uh, Ministry of Public Information, later Ministry of Culture and uh, information and Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Public Information, they were just like a PCA, Production Code Administrator, or the um, Pentagon, 
the Department of Defense, when Hallyu producer take their script to Pentagon, Pentagon collect all these different opinions of their branches, Army and Air Force and all these different branches. Just like that, this uh, public information, Ministry of Public Information, share this uh, review copies with you know, education, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Interior, KCIA, or even sometimes U USA CIA, American CIA, um, there are different concerns. The Ministry of uh, um, Public Information was a sort of this consolidator, just like a PCA in, in Hollywood or, or Pentagon. And uh, there was always this complicity and uh, collaboration, bargaining and negotiation. This is a really what, what's really wonderful about censorship studies. It worked exactly the same in so-called Western democracy, whether that's European and American, or this uh, semi-democratic slash, you know, authoritarianism of Park Jong-il regime because there were elections, it was not complete authoritarianism or even communist regime. There are always this uh, room for negotiation. So that's really what's amazing about censorship studies. You can really apply the same kind of understanding of censorship to different regimes, different political regimes. So what I wanted to talk today, we don't have a lot of time, really running out of time, is this myth. And actually, I myself, <laughs> in my, my earlier scholarship, I said that, you know, Park Jong-il regime uh, banned this film. This uh, you, Park Jong-il authoritarian regime banned this film because of this uh, one line, Gaja, Gaja. You know, this was a family from North Korea. So Park Jong-il regime thought this was pro-North sentiment. You know, this um, mother, demented mother of this very, very poor family from North Korea, North Korean, um, the migrant from North Korea. She keeps saying Kaja, that means so let's go back, let's go, go back to North Korea. So that's the reason why this was censored. That was sort of a trade legend. And actually when Park Jong-hee uh, government uh, took over after coup d'etat, they reviewed this uh, 35 domestic film and 24 Foreign film. This is actually um, archival revisionism. This is already published in a book called Cold Wars and Asian Cinemas. And out of these six foreign films were banned based on moral reasons, and only one Korean film was banned. That's the that's the um, the stray bullet. And Ariel actually um, presented it. You can watch it for free. It's sometimes called Aimless Bullet. It's sort of Korean, the greatest Korean realist masterpiece. But if you actually look at the document, that's not true. The film was not banned because of that line. Let's go back. That's one of the one of the things that there was pick up. And another thing which is interesting, who initiated this banning? <laughs> so that's the the Security Bureau of Ministry of Interior. So they are interested in anti-communism. They're interested in policing, right? So they came up with this idea, this is a very dangerous film. They got to view of Korea and I translated this archival document into English, ideologically subversive and hatred of a capitalist society and anti-American sentiment because of a negative portrayal of US soldiers. Um, and then, but what's most important, why they're banned is because of the ending and miserably without implying any solution to collective despair of variance on unemployed or underpaid and underclass citizens. This is not that different from how PCA was concerned about film noir, that the tone of pessimism, you know, because um, in Hollywood they wanted like more uplifting, you know, uplifting moral messages. So this is not that far from actually Hollywood censorship, though the idea behind it. And if you compare these two films, they're both anti-capitalist. The Coachman and the Stray Bullet, they're, all, they're both anti-capitalist. Actually, Coachman was also under the list, this uh, so-called impure, the Security Bureau also put this film, but Coachman was not banned because it had an uplifting ending. And yes, there was anti-excuse anti, me, anti-capitalist content, subcontext, but ultimately it, it, it's a happy ending. So this film was not banned. And what's also very interesting is, so, th so they had a two meetings. Um, so I think that you think this is a, you know, this is a dictatorship, so they would just ban it, but they had a lot of meetings. There are a lot of, uh, you know, actually deliberation and from different perspective, 
you know, different branches of the government, interior, they are more interested in anti-communism, right? Justice Department, education, obviously education. That's another thing in Asian cinema, you know, Asian cinema, unlike Hollywood, Hollywood is 100% profit, you know, for profit. But in Asian cinema, that Chinese or, you know, Chang Ge Shek, some the public are Chinese or, or, or Korean, it's about the public education, public enlightenment. So they had a different purpose in Asia, uh, the role of cinema. So there was that and KCIA, obviously they were more interested in also anti-communism. And, and then they had a second meeting <laughs> and with interior education, public information. Public information was the main window. They were, they were actually notably absent in the first meeting and the KCIA, they ultimately suspended the film. But if you look at the evaluation, it's really interesting. PCA also does that too. You know, they when they try to censor like films by Chaplin, they feel really sorry that they're actually asking Chaplin to change something. So here they actually recognize Ministry of Public Information, the central window for state censorship. They recognize outstanding work of art. But their problem was because it exposes social ills and misery of people. Before the coup d'etat, before about the coup d'etat, it contradicts the EU government idea of national reconstruction. So this is not really that outrageous demand. <laughs> this is something you expected in, in also like other governments, like the Chinese government of the 1940s, so nationalist government, KMT's government, Chang Ge government had the same idea about, about the role of, uh, of a cinema. <laughs> So what's kind of another, another fascinating thing is the repeal process. So if this is a complete authoritarian regime, you know, they will not even allow repeal. So there was a repeal process and the producer, film producer um, submitted a petition asking for repeal. And he himself, um, he actually added for, forward and he positioned this film as, as a national uplift film. And uh, he also explained what let's go that Kaja means. And, and then they said that he basically tried to sell this as a, some film that uh, in, in um, accordance of the Yu Park uh, military regime state policy. So this is a uh, shameless self <laughs> promotion. My, uh, my book, Hollywood Diplomacy, Dr. Son. Uh, Introduce. I talk about the role of the national uplifts. It, this came from the actual State Department document of Chinese film censorship. This is a very similar that national idea about national uplift 1930s uh, Chinese censorship principle. I think Park Jung is a uh, uh, film censorship. Park Jung era film censorship principle had a very similar idea. We might have called it more like the enlightenment rather than national uplift. In China, 1930s, they called it national uplift. This, this term came from the State Department document, and then American diplomats did not understand that because they, for them, you know, there's no educational educational purposes of American cinema. American cinema was to, was to entertain, to make profit, not necessarily to educate or uplift the audiences. So this, this type of idea really confused American diplomats, but you can kind of see the similarity between Park Jung era uh, censorship and then the national uplift Chinese 1930s uh, Republican era nationalist censorship. So ultimately in two years that ban was lifted, but the way Korean film industry rallied behind this Yu Hong this auteur, uh, the director of uh, um, this uh, stray bullet, they were very smart. They knew how to pressure the government. <laughs> they used public opinion, they used the press. They, they also invited you know, Western critics, you know, USC professor Richard McCain, who supported the film, wrote a letter <laughs> on behalf of Yu Hyun Mo, and the uh, trade organization, the, so equivalent to MPAA, America's MPAA, it's called MPAK. <laughs> so trade organization was really behind it. And so what's very interesting here, I told you that uh, the Ministry of uh, Public Information, their role was mediating um, capacity. They're not necessarily oppressor. They're collecting different you know, opinions of different uh, the government branches. Ultimately, this banning was initiated by Ministry of Interior and KCIA, not necessarily the Ministry of uh, Public Information, who is the central window for state censorship. 
And what, what these documents say to me is that they initially um, allow, ministry allow the re-release. And then they somehow mysteriously, like three days later, at least in did that, <laughs> that original letter, said, no, 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 time is not right. <laughs> they initially um, allowed re-release on the condition of cutting this let's go scene, you know, which was consider like maybe pronounced, maybe not. And then also cutting some scenes um, negatively portraying American soldiers. They initially said, yeah, it's okay to really live under condition. And then they mysteriously said three days later, no, 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 time is not right. Then mysteriously uh, a month later, the producers came with better reason for lifting ban. That better reason is that, oh, we got an invitation from San Francisco and MGM is interested in uh, in, importing, <laughs> importing our film. This is a much, much better reason because ministry has to explain to KCIA and the Ministry of Interior why they're allowing, you know, because it, it was the ban was originally initiated by KCIA and the Ministry of Interior, you know, for, for the um, security, national security reason, they had to explain, the Ministry of uh, um, Public Information had to explain to other branches why they're re-allowing, uh, lifting banning, unbanning. And then you kind of see the ministry was already behind this <laughs> and then maybe even gave the tip to the producers, this is a much better region uh, for petition repeal because the, the day after, <laughs> the day after this um, petition, they already had all signed up. Minister, minister himself already signed up, signed, signed that we release um, the permit. And then they send a one line letter to the producer. So I must have, I have to assume they collaborated. It's a Ministry of Public Information, and and the producer they collaborated because it's already done there. They're just uh, they had to leave this uh, paper trail, and uh, so this is the. I don't have time. Uh, why it was a good excuse? Um, if you, you know, I don't have time. But at that time, the Kennedy government was really. Uh, pressuring um, the transition military junta. There, it was a uh, rule by the Park Chung-hee government, a uh, rule by military junta for two years. And the uh, Kennedy government was with, withholding foreign aid and really in exchange for pushing for free election. And then there was also a currency devaluation. So the government was very desperate to, to generate uh, foreign currency, the export. So really pushing for export economy so that idea about MGM might be, you know, opening up the market, um, really, really think of Stable Lit is a great film, and then MGM might be importing Korean film, that was really good reason, a good reason for petitioning. And yeah, the film went to San Francisco, did not get a lot of good, good uh, reception. So Yes, although the film is a really great film, the, the government itself, government recognized that, but the ending is fucking depressing. And uh, this, uh, let's let's go, this, the patriarch becomes this, the titular stray bullet. He has so many obligations. He doesn't know where to go. His wife just died and his uh, youngest, youngest uh, brother is in jail and his mother is uh, crazy and at home, he doesn't know where to go. It's very realistic, but it did not really appeal universally as opposed to the coachman. The coachman two years earlier went to Berlin and received silver there. So the government assessment about uplifting message, why that was important to Korean society and how that also had a universal appeal because it was the coachman not stray bullet that was recognized. This is the first Korean film which received this uh, major award you know, in an international film festival. So the government's assessment was not necessarily um, just authoritarian. It actually had, I think very, you know, it, it was smart, you know, especially you, you compare this foreign reception of these two films, you kind of see the government assessment was not out there or just politically motivated because it was a cultural policy, not necessarily 100% political policy. The political aspect came from Ministry of Interior and Ministry of uh, KCIA, but the, uh, 
public uh, Ministry of Public Information's policy was cultural policy. And they actually, this is a very similar in terms of cultural policy. Um, it was very similar how Hollywood regulation worked and especially US government when they were involved in some type of script review through the propaganda agency like Office of War Information during the World War II, they said the same thing, you know, they really wanted to make more uplifting or cheery films. So one of the criteria Korean government really um, recommended is the cheery films, uh, what, what, what they call like uh, 생활의, 명량, 생활의 명량화, you know, cheering everyday life. That was something they really um, recommended. They really had a war, cultural war against pessimism. This is a very, very pessimistic, real, almost nihilistic film, uh, straight bullet. So you can kind of understand uh, from a government perspective, whether that's Korean government or US government during the World War II, why government discourages that kind of a defeatism attitude, especially during the um, cultural crisis or national security crisis like the Cold War. So we are really running out of time. So I don't really have time to, uh, to go over everything, but I think I wanted to um, wrap up here just quoting uh, this um, Shin sang uh, Steve, um, Steve Jung's film, I, I'm sorry, Steve Jung's book, how this idea about political subversion in film was possible in any historical period or any, any country for that matter. And further that such practices were matters of personal volition both skews the historical record and misconstrued the processes of film authorship and production. This insight is universal. It applies to Hollywood, it applies to Korea during the authoritarian regime. And I think this is a really very overestimate because uh, in, in Korean film historiography, there's always this tendency to value resistant art. Uh, we are talking about cinema <laughs> made for profit. And, and then that kind of, a, we are talking about what Korean cinema should be rather than what Korean cinema was as a commercial art. In the interest of time, I'll wrap up here. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you so much, Professor Chang, for such an illuminating talk. Um, so now we, I would like to open the discussion to the floor. So technically the panel, uh, the given time has ended, but we are, I mean, generously granted some more time to, for allowing uh, more discussion um, um, through Q&A. So there were uh, several questions to uh, Dr. No Gwangu, but um, he have answered. He has answered to those questions uh, by himself. But later, uh, I can um, get you uh, get him um, to discuss more. So first question is from um, um, Simon Chang um, to Ariel. So I'm gonna just read. So fascinating paper, Ariel. Um, the table you shared in Kofa is holding listed list holding uh, list of feature films. Uh, what is the archive's position and your views on acquisition of non-feature length productions? Well, um, they generally are searching for uh, feature length films, and they it they call them um, it, it the non-feature and uh, non-feature films generally called um, either amateur films or uh, they're like home movies. They include home movies or short films or um, uh, travelogues or things of that variety. Um, and uh, they, they do have some. Um, in fact, the, um, they got some in that set, the repatriation from uh, New Zealand. So some of that what included um, some non um, some non feature films, um, but Kofa in general looks for feature films. They um, unless they are from the colonial era um, or really old, um, they try to focus on features um, unless they are from. Um, a specific era, and then they will they will ex they will try to they will be like, okay, uh, archives in general will do that. Um, 
unless like the one that they were getting stuff from like um you know tonga they do a lot of non-feature stuff so it just really depends but for um for me uh because archives um uh, diversify so much i think it's it's perfectly fine um and i think the way that kofa is um handling it makes perfect sense um because you uh i think in my in my um thing you saw there's zero percent and of like stuff from the 20s 30s and 40s up till that if the if what they're looking for in features and it's the only stuff that they can get for um and they're it for features and they are lo just looking for um and accepting travel logs or um stuff from the korean war that military could get or very short clips and things if he if that's all they can find um space is at a modic is is very small for 35 35 is this big and you can't you can only get so much stuff so i think that answers it okay thank you so if you i mean from the audience if you have any questions please put that on the q a function on the zoom um so i, I can read it on, on behalf of you so uh the uh, panelists who could answer so there's another question from um dr da, da young jin to dr chang about um i'm gonna just read it so how do you think the contemporary censorship including the blacklist scandal compared to old days do you think it is a special case um i think by it i think um it's uh, yeah i uh, yeah i um blacklisting scandal is very different from this type of content regulation or ratings because there was a blacklisting in hollywood that, that's, that's the same, Mekatera blacklisting. That's different from content regulation or ratings. I think what we can talk about is ratings, where the rating is censorship, because there, there are scholars who believe ratings are censorship also, because you get harsher rating, then you lose money, millions of dollars. And <laughs> what rating goes harsher, then you lose a lot of money. So obviously, producers want lower ratings. So that's a really complex issue. You know, I think that will take me another 10 minutes to <laughs> talk about ratings. Uh, I don't want it to do that. But I do not see blacklisting, you know, that's the same as this content regulation or ratings. I think one we can talk about is ratings, not necessarily this blacklisting. That's very special, politically motivated. Okay. Um, so uh, I think there was a question to Dr. No uh, about the uh, um, um, Song Kang Ho's image, and um, I think uh, you already have answered to it. But can you uh, can you elaborate on that, please? Oh, so, okay. What questions? I have a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, there were two questions from Ian Dixon. Uh, I think um, yes. Uh, maybe the second question might be uh, a good one uh, in relation to your discussion of the father figure, uh, the romantic okay. comedy, and so on. So um, I'm going to just read it. So do you think Song's role in Secret Sunshine is an example of thwarted lover with support his no wife, no lover status or challenges it? Uh, OK, uh, I didn't uh, mention the Secret Sunshine in my presentation because it's rather John Do Young film. John Do Young film rather than Song Kang Ho's film. Song Kang Ho was in the supporting role. And in that film, Song Kang Ho tried to get the John Do love. Uh, so the focus on the film is the John Do Young's acting. Uh, as, you, as we already know, the John Do Young got the female best female actors award at the Panopil Festival. And then in terms of the function, the Song Kang was sacrificed. So she, he supported the John Do Young's acting. But in that film, he geniusly showed one aspect of the Korean, Korean male. That is the too much consideration. Too much considera consideration with no consent of woman. Which the imposed her to the, that is the kind of the very bothering or the online side. Yeah, that's the, what the find in the, in the film. Yeah, that's my answer. I already put the, my answer to the, the, the Ian Dixon's. 
So, think... yeah, that is the worst of the one, the supporting role. Okay, thank you so much for the answers. Um, so as a final question, I think I want to ask all of the panelists um, for today um, uh, about your own topic. Um, so my question is like, so you all kind of work on different aspects, different uh, uh, sectors of Korean film industry, but uh, I think I want to ask what do you think would be the implication on the um, South Korean industry of your uh, discussions? For example, what is the implication of the star image uh, in the Korean South Korean in, uh, industry? Or what is the implication of censorship uh, in a larger um, um, concept of industry? So, it's a big question, but please kind of keep it brief. Thank you. Oh, I will start. Um, oh, me? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, um, I think we really need to change <laughs> what sense of, I think we really need to start from the beginning because there was always this idea that the Korean art is against the censorship that's really not recognizing reality. There's a lot of issues about racism now in Korean cinema. We have to think about how to moderate that type of anti-Chinese racism in Korean cinema. That's the all part of the regulation. Censorship is not you know, one, one party just oppressing the other. Censorship is, is a response, responsible response. Industry is a responsible response to market demand. And I think that's very important to understand. And, and then another thing is by revisioning that idea about censorship, we can enter the dialogue with censorship studies around the world and, and really stop thinking about this oppression versus resistance paradigm. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Okay. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I think we should conclude our panel tonight and today. So I understand you, some of you still have some questions burning in your heart, um, but hopefully we'll have another chance to communicate, um, hopefully for sure. Um, so thank you for all your participation. Um, I would like to thank our panelists for their wonderful insights into the cultural significance of South Korean film industry. Uh, more events are coming up for tomorrow and this Friday. So tomorrow we'll have two more panels about transnational aspects of Korean cinema industry. And this Friday, the director of the celebrated film, The House of Hummingbird, um, Kim Bora, will join us in the REACH conversation about the debut feature uh, with film critic Maggie Lee. So I hope you won't miss this great opportunity. Um, since we are all across the world, please check the um, starting time in your time zone from the conference website. Um, thank you so much again for your participation, um, no matter how much it is left. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.